Okay, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you very much for rejoining the first session of Innovation Forum. And my name is Hiro Okayasu, and I'm a coordinator of Healthy Aging here at the WHO Western Pacific Regional Office. And uh, now we'd like to start with uh, another housekeeping announcement. Yes. So as uh, uh, Dr. Gundu reminded us uh, this morning, please make sure that you log in as your full name, uh, first name and a last name, and then refrain from any marketing product or services. And then you're welcome to uh, enter the question using the Q&A function while we are discussing. And we'll come to the uh, discussion at the end of the session. And we are very excited to talk about how digital and then technological and social innovation are supporting healthy aging as an opportunity, uh, sorry, as an opportunity, as an enabler for people to continue being healthy, active, and contributing members of the society. Uh, please go to next. So as uh, in the morning, so we are happy to have an uh, uh, illustrator from uh, Pushpin here in the Philippines, and then they're going to sort of continue drawing the message as it comes out from the session. Go to next. And then we have a very fortunate to have an opportunity to be expert in this session. So Ms. Stella Luck from Dimanji and Professor Naoki Kondo from University of Kyoto and then Ms. Huyun Aileen Jun from Seoul 50 Plus Foundation, and then Ms. Masako Akiyama from Maggie's Tokyo and then CARES. And first we will hear from the expert and there'll be a Q&A session following their talks. So please send in their questions using the Q&A function. Before hearing from our expert, I'd like to briefly introduce the topic of uh, healthy aging and then innovation. For the next. So as we know, all know that the countries in Western Pacific are aging very rapidly. And aging is a global phenomenon. So all countries are experiencing population aging. So can you put the animation? And then pace of aging accelerated in some countries like Japan and Korea after year 2000. And then after year 2020, that most countries will follow the path and then achieve, uh, sorry, reach to the aged society. Go to the next. So this is the stories for the small font. The, the length of the bar represents the time for transition from aging to aged. And then previously, Australia and New Zealand, it took more than 60 years, and Japan is about 25 years. And then if you look at the bars, the length of the bar is getting shorter and shorter, meaning that the translation or uh, transition uh, speed is accelerating. So the future countries needs to do the similar transition that Australia and then New, New Zealand, Japan has gone through in a much shorter time period. Go to next. And in this uh, uh, aging society, what we'd like to achieve is uh, uh, the following. And we'd like to achieve that healthier, older people in the Western Pacific thriving and contributing in their society. Press, press the button. And if you don't do anything, that these people will have a poor health and greater reliance on social security and health systems and press next. And then with an investment, however, we will have uh, improved health, greater social participation and contribution to the society. Or the next. And one of the big changes due to the population aging is the shifting disease burden from communicable to non-communicable diseases. If you look aside, communicable diseases, there is a clear boundary, healthy and then sick. So the intervention can be uh, one off and then people become healthy and go back home. But in the non-communicable disease world, this boundary is become much broader, bra, bra, sorry. The distinction is not as clear as uh, before. And therefore, on the left-hand side, WHO proposes the model to uh, intervention starting when they are still healthy. And then as they get older and then the functional ability and intrinsic capacities are going down, then we provide the care and then the medical service and then social services are based on their needs throughout their lives. Go to next. And then for us to address this uh, uh, change, uh, we'd like to uh, also uh, make a change in health systems with the integrated and continuous service delivery model that addresses individual and community needs. 
So as the many speakers talked about this morning, so we put the people in the center, individuals and families at the center of care, which is supported by the communities with the coordinated and integrated services, such as preventive services, social welfare services, and curative services. And then this model is empowered through the technological and then social innovation, and then uh, enable environment and then support system to foster. Go to next. And then uh, this transformation of health system requires uh, different types of innovations. And today we are going to introduce a few types of uh, innovation, such as technological innovation, nudging, and then social innovation. But I'm going to come to this a little bit more detail. Go to next. So first, technological innovation. So there was a lot of talk uh, this morning about it. So technology enables health system transformation, such as robotics to support medical and nursing care at healthcare facilities, as the uh, doctor, <coughs> sorry, as the, as the uh, uh, example from Japan indicated that the, uh, the nursing care robot enables that the better nursing care. And then number two is the data sharing to uh, optimize care pathway, cross-sectoral collaboration and outsourcing. So one example is a China's DXY and which enables to streamline the patient's question and then the triage using the uh, uh, technology. And then the last one is a big data and IoT enabling personalized medicine and prevention. And in other words, we call it a precision care and a better self-care. So that's sort of another example here is like a mom pen from Mongolia enabling that the electronic medical record and then better care for uh, everybody. And go to next. So government can indeed facilitate the innovation in different ways. And as uh, Dr. Sahara mentioned in the morning, for Society 5.0 in Japan, they identify the relevant technology and showing the roadmap and then the vision. And, or government could build an investment case for adapting the new technology, or they could foster environment for innovation such as financial support, networking opportunities, and community hubs. And then they also collaborate with the different ministries and then sectors. And then they could support R&D, and they could promote safe and then affordable adoption of digital technology, starting with the public sector. Go to next. So the other innovation we'd like to introduce today is the nudging for better choices. And then Professor Kondo will explain it in the detail, so I'm not going into the details. But this is a textbook definition, but I realized that uh, uh, this morning's the Professor Garea's metaphor on goldfish and then water describes this concept very well. So we need to make sure to create an environment for goldfish to go swim in the right direction, rather than telling goldfish which way to go. So this is a concept of uh, nudging, creating an environment for the individuals to make uh, good choices for themselves and in community. Go to next. So there are a few examples, and then Professor Kondo will explain more examples as well. But uh, you might have seen in the COVID-19, there is some sort of a physical distancing chairs signs so that uh, people, people are sitting uh, not close, close to each other in, in a seat. Or you might have seen that the calorie burning steps, so indicate number of calories burned for climbing stairs, it to motivate people to take stairs, and or a smaller plate, simply to make sure that you don't eat uh, too much with a smaller plate. Go to next. And the government again can encourage the nudging. So there are a few examples. One from Japan, behavioral science team in the Ministry of Environment is a working group in the multi-ministerial uh, working group and providing the technical support, opportunity for networking, and then the actual implementation of the nudge, and especially in the public sector, and to encourage the people to start adapting this new sort of ways of behavioral change. Go to next. And also uh, there is a, a behavioral inside team, nudging unit under the cabinet secretariat in the United Kingdom and that focuses on the generating evidence on nudging and then provide evidence into the policies. And then this is the, the role of the government, encouraging nudging adapted, adapted more into the uh, policy for the next. So the last category of the innovation is a social innovation and entrepreneurship, which is to offer the noble solution to address the social issues 
And rather than explaining me too much, so this is an example of a Nabari city in Japan, which we observed last year. And the left-hand side is a group of older people get together in a community. And then they are help, trying to help in each other, coordinating like what we can do and what we need. And right-hand side is an example of uh, giving someone, uh, older people giving other older people right for the shopping or going to the doctors and they can join together. Go next. There are other examples. Left-hand side is the Ginkgo House restaurant in Hong Kong. They are primarily hiring older people from IT to management to cooking and then waiting, waiting tables. And then they hired over 3,000 older people over the last 15 years. And then this is an example of like older people actively participate in the community through the entrepreneurship. And right-hand side is the enabler called Kiba, is an online micro-lending platform which support people uh, in the low income settings and an entrepreneur with the social causes. And then this is a crowdfunding sort of a mechanism to uh, support the local entrepreneurs in a low resource setting to do the sort of a business, small business that helps them and then helps the community. The next. And then this social innovation is really beneficial for healthy aging. So for instance, older people, there is a direct benefit they become entrepreneurs and then employees, and then more intellectually, physically, and socially active, which is very important part of healthy aging. And also they can be an innovation recipient, and then that support their life, as in the case of this community volunteer in Navari City. And on the right-hand side, enterprises also have a direct benefit being part of this movement because that they can uh, capitalize the skilled and experienced labor or the people, and then they gain the knowledge and an experience through this, uh, their participation. And also like unlocking the financial opportunities by catering to the silver market. And as a result, there is a benefit to the society by living more inclusive and cohesive society result, resulting in the overall higher social capital. Next. And again, there are lots of things that the government can do again. So social innovations to promote age-friendly environment and then uh, inclusive society. Identify trained local community champions who can help implement sustainable innovations or attract private sector investment in the silver market and portray this as an opportunity rather than a cost. And then partner with existing social entrepreneurship networks and then hubs and also we can do a dialogue with the labor and employment department of the government to enable more social participation of older people. I think this is an overview and then now we'd like to hear from the more actual examples and their experiences. So now uh, with that brief introduction, I'd like to invite Ms. Stella Luck to tell us how Dimanji is moving the digital innovation. Over to you, Ms. Luck. Hi everyone, this is Stella and uh, first of all, very excited and pleased to have the opportunity to talk to you today about digital innovation through the LIFE course. Next slide. In this conversation, what I'll talk about is uh, Damagi as an organization, what we do, what our technology does, and after that go through a few use cases of how our technology can be used, uh, some general examples, some specific examples, uh, and then some lessons learned in that aspect. Uh, but in general, when we talk about what is Damagi, Damagi is a social enterprise that creates mobile technologies for frontline health workers to be able to improve and amplify and strengthen services that are provided at the last mile through innovative technologies. Next slide. We work all over the world in about 80 countries uh, and have done about 2,000 projects uh, in areas that include non-communicable diseases, uh, eye care, uh, mental health, uh, maternal and child health, and other sectors, which I will get into. Next. Comcare, our product platform, is an open source uh, product uh, that is used, as I said, to strengthen and, and amplify the work of frontline health workers. Uh, in, the past, in the past few years, we've seen exponential growth of the use of this application to the point where it is currently being used by over 600,000 frontline workers across the low and middle income worlds, uh, supporting a beneficiary population in the tens of millions, uh, if not higher, at this point. Next. 
Before getting into some of the more specific use cases, I wanted to highlight some of the trends that we're seeing in terms of the adoption of Comcare as a global good, uh, which I think to some degree also reflects some of the exponential uptake that we are seeing in the in the use of other uh, open source global good technologies like Comcare. Uh, again, we're seeing exponential growth in the number of frontline workers who are using this kind of tool. Uh, we've seen a sort of expansion of, of dozens of peer reviewed articles, including with regards to Comcare, at least eight RCTs demonstrating interesting and positive outcomes and the ability of this kind of technology to provide uh, and improve health uh, health outcomes as well as uh, as well as processes and finally as a social enterprise we've been very gratified to see a 60 percent year-on-year product revenue growth uh, indicating that increased demand in the market of, uh, of funders and organizations that are seeing value in this kind of intervention next And in terms of what is the Comcare platform, it is multiple things, uh, but at the end of the day, it is a platform or a system for creating mobile technology tools for frontline workers. One of the key things that it is uh, adapted and optimized for uh, is being a no-code platform that non-engineers can take and use and create a mobile app for treatment adherence or for visit reminders or for social and behavior change that can be deployed within a matter of hours because we found that it is so important to be able to rapidly prototype, rapidly iterate, redesign, reconfigure these applications over the course of time to make them usable. It also includes a case management feature because uh, in talking about uh, patient-centric care, it is critically important that there is this online offline capability to be able to track what is the journey of a patient through uh, the continuum of care, uh, both so that the provider has that information, but also so that the software and the technology can prompt and present information that is the right information at the right time to the beneficiary and to the health provider to be able to enforce uh, and sustain the right kind of treatment protocols. It is also multi-platform multi and capable of working offline uh, so that the technology can reach people where they are, whether it's through mobile or through web or through messaging platforms like SMS and WhatsApp. And perhaps most importantly, uh, it is powerfully customizable and extensible, which is something that we would recommend for all open source global good technologies uh, and can be used and adapted for different uh, subsector, uh, subsectors of the health system and can also be used and adapted for the different needs of different countries as well. Next. Now I wanted to talk a little bit more specifically about how this technology is used in practice uh, because again, like these kind of systems, uh, it matters who is the user, it matters what is the context in which they're being used. Uh, the first example I cite uh, is, is actually one in the, is, is one in the nutrition domain, um, which is of course very important for the overall lifelong development and cognitive functioning of individuals. Uh, this application, the ICDS CAS application, uh, is used in about 28 of the 36 states uh, in India um, and tracking about one in 50 malnourished children in the world currently. And this application, what it does is it enables community nutrition workers to be able to track uh, the, the growth and development of children over time to automatically aggregate that information and plot it in graphs and information that is then presented to the health worker or to the supervisor or to others in the health pyramid, uh, as well as send customized messages to beneficiaries so that they can understand, for example, that if the growth of their child has, uh, is not increasing, that they need to bring their child to the health center. Uh, this application includes behavior change messaging, uh, including proper counseling on nutrition protocols. Uh, it includes immunization schedules, uh, food ration tracking, and also the tracking of attendance, both for the health worker uh, to show up at community nutrition centers to make sure that they're opening them, uh, but also of children to those uh, nutrition centers to make sure that they're availing of these services. Um, and we've put in a ton of work, and this is an important factor of bringing technology to scale, um, to make it localizable so it is available in 17 languages um, according to different language profiles of the different regions of India. And the other aspect I'll mention about this is that from a government perspective, there's a five-tier dashboard that presents to each government official based on their particular jurisdiction and catchment area, what are the process indicators, what are the outcome indicators that are relevant to them, and what are the process indicators specifically that will drive them to follow up with the right sets of districts um, and the right sets of um, subordinates uh, in their chain of command to be able to foster things like open and community nutrition centers, having the right facilities uh, be ready and available with the right resources to provide care, uh, and paying special attention to those areas with poor health outcomes. Next slide. 
This example is in the, in the domain of uh, non-communicable diseases. So this is a tool that was deployed in Haryana and Karnataka in India to be able to aid nurses working at primary health centers on the care of hypertension and diabetes mellitus, along with associated comorbidities of obesity, uh, tobacco, alcohol, and mental health. And so this kind of application is used by a nurse to enter in certain key information related to medical history to be able to capture and screen initial information from patients coming into the health center about their lifestyle choices. And it auto computes a suggested protocol based on best of breed clinical protocols developed by leading health experts in India and beyond of how this person, what is the drug regimen, for example, that this person should take, what are other lifestyle recommendations that this person should take. And all of that is summarized into a summary recommendation that is then submitted to a physician for uh, their consideration, as well as potentially their disagreement in case the physician is able to come up with a more sophisticated uh, recommendation like that. And so this kind of system where the real opportunities are here is one with regards to task shifting, which I'll say more about in a bit, um, but the ability to leverage nurses to increase the breadth and scope of care that the health system can provide in a world of limited physicians. Uh, two, in terms of being able to automate uh, and improve uh, things that will then reduce error in dosing or errors in prescription and identification of contraindications uh, as well and other drug event tracking uh, as well. Next slide. Finally, the third example I wanted to cite is ScriptMate, uh, which is an R&D tool that we've developed uh, related to an application that is used directly by the elderly to be able to, one, use image recognition to identify the pills that they have so that they can uh, more readily make, uh, be able to discern that, especially in a context where eyesight uh, may be declining, uh, to, to enable that uh, elderly person to track and monitor the medication that they're taking in, and three, to share that information with health providers. Uh, for, for other various reasons, including, for example, with online pharmacies in case there needs to be refills, or potentially with care providers in case there's some kind of event and they're brought into the ER and it needs to be clear what is the medication that they've recently taken. Uh, there is a growing body of evidence that shows the possible uh, effectiveness of tools like this to be able to encourage uh, medication adherence and appropriate medication adherence, uh, which is particularly important, for example, if the routines uh, in, in an elder person's lifestyle get disrupted. Um, and similarly, to be able to share information with health providers uh, so that they're able to track, okay, what are the last set of medications that this person has specifically taken uh, as well. Next slide. Finally, I wanted to summarize with some lessons learned uh, on our journey working with governments and health systems in the adoption of, of digital innovation uh, throughout, the, throughout the life course. Um, I think one thing that I mentioned earlier that I'll say again is that if we want to uh, provide quality of care and coverage of care to the communities um, that we're seeking to reach, uh, it will be important that, uh, uh, that those at the front lines, community health workers, primary health care providers are enlisted and increasingly enlisted in this effort and digital technologies like these, as basic as they are, uh, can, can help that process uh, happen, can help with things like protocol adherence uh, and visit reminders and medication reminders and so on and so forth. Um, another aspect as well is that if we want for there to be that synergistic use of the technology across multiple health verticals, there also needs to be that programmatic coordination at the ministry level and at the interministerial level so that these primary health care providers are properly equipped with the right protocols and the right direction to be able to do their jobs and to do it in a coordinated way with technology that amplifies that, that synergy as well. Um, and then the final observation, which has been said many times, but I'll say it again, is that, um, is that we shouldn't, uh, from a data collection perspective, we shouldn't collect data uh, that nobody is planning on using. Every time we add a data point into tools like this, it creates work for health workers who are already busy. Uh, and so we need to be intentional and plan from the start. What are the quality improvement and the data reporting and the data-driven decision-making requirements of this technology so that we don't capture more data and create more work at the last mile um, than what it is that we intended to do. That's it for my presentation. Looking forward to getting into more uh, detail in the discussion. Thank you. OK, thank you very much, uh, Ms. Luck. And Comcare is well known to frontline workers in public health. And it is great to learn that the demand continues to push the boundaries of innovation for sustainable impact, particularly in a low resource setting. 
So as we move on, uh, if you have a question, please enter your question into a Q&A function and then we'll compile and then we will address at the end of the presentations. Right. Now, we will switch gears to learn more about social innovation from uh, Professor Kondo, who is an expert on uh, aging as well as the nudging for behavioral change. So Professor Kondo, thank you very much for your time and then uh, over to you. Hi everyone, can you hear me? All right, so I am now Kikondo from Kyoto University. I'm a professor of social epidemiology and I'm studying about how to re control the health inequality in the society. So today I want to talk about uh, how to implement the concept nudging to uh, reduce health inequality, uh, especially among older people. Uh, next, please. Next slide, please. Okay. So this is uh, three recommendations by the WHO about how to uh, address the social determinants of health, as you may know. Uh, one is to improve daily living conditions rather than just providing the messages to improve your own health by yourself, like, you know, uh, do more good diet or something like that. And to do so, the, because the health sector is not, uh, uh, health sector is powerless about controlling uh, the uh, environment other than health systems like you know transportation and employment uh, conditions and education like that so we need strengthening governance and make a good partnerships between the other sectors and to do so so we need to also uh, utilize the data and understand the impacts of potential interventions on the equity in uh, health. So the, the three recommendations are more, very important. Next, please. So this is a case of a Jap Japanese uh, society about how to implement the three recommendations, which is called, in, for older people, which is called community-based integrated care system. And uh, so older people have many problems, not only the health problems, but also in some problems in daily living conditions. So the government started this system in which the many care giving partners or organizations have a good partnership in the community and provide the, the cares about housing, long-term care, uh, health care, and many others. Oh, could you please go back? Uh, in an integrated way, and and uh, which is, this kind of partnership is is very important to make a good uh, uh, nudging environment. For example, next please. This is one of the case uh, the the product of those community based integrated care. Care the local people have uh, uh, organizing this kind of. Uh, social gathering places, it's called a salon, community salon, and in which all, uh, local people that just uh, social gathering and pro, uh, have many kind of activities by themselves. And uh, the, according to our study, the those who are pa participating in this kind of activities are less likely to develop functional decline compared to non-participants. So the just social providing the opportunity for social gathering can be the major to reduce uh, long-term care uh, need. So the, another case study is uh, from the Adachi city, uh, which the other city, which is the north end of the Tokyo metropolitan area. Next, please. And what the excellence of other city is to change the policy making scheme in the commun in the in the city uh, from the government to governance. I.e., previously the government just ordered the uh, some uh, projects to other sectors like non uh, the citizen, the companies, and other organizations. But uh, recently they changed to the scheme to make a citywide co-create, it's called a co-creating platform. Just uh, horizontally, those organizations have a partnerships and create the, uh, the new uh, policies together. Next, please. So under this kind of co-creating 
platform. This is one of the case study about uh, the one um, unique campaign about the 15 yen cashback for vegetable rich meal ordering in local restaurants under the partnerships between the city government and the local restaurants. And uh, just as this is a flyer by the city government, say like eat out often, eat vegetable meals at partner restaurants and get 50 yen cashback, limited type offer like many uh, food companies are doing. But this time this is done by the city government. And the other result, during the campaign, low-income and unemployed people increased the ordering of vegetable-rich meals more than others. So this kind of uh, intervention may be effective in uh, reducing the inequality in behavior change. Next, please. So the, based on the bounded theory of bounded rationality, it is related to the nudging concept. A person may purchase a vegetable-rich meal even though the person values the extra vegetables with a meal less than 50 Japanese yen. This kind of idea cannot be, it's difficult to be produced by the city government only. So the great partnerships with you know, local companies and the many organizations as citizens that can be uh, useful to create this kind of uh, activities. Next, please. Okay, so the how can we, uh, the current challenge and opportunities like this. We need to maintain the physical distancing. So it is difficult to make social gathering opportunities like community salon I as I introduced. And for organizations who create the policies, it's difficult to make partnerships in on-site. But the opportunity is the development of technologies and the accumulated personal data which is available uh, in the public. And many technologies are available, like information, the community technologies, artificial intelligence, and the spread of personal digital devices. So we need to, it's better to utilize these opportunities uh, as much as possible. Next, please. Okay, for example, so now there are many, you know, healthcare uh, apps for mobile devices. This is one of the examples in Japan, so you can, so like in the morning, when you uh, start up the app, so you are asked by the AI chatbot, like, did you eat breakfast? And you uh, took a pic, you will take a picture of your breakfast, then the AI analyzes the picture and provides the nutrition information. And the chatbot re responded, wow, very well balanced meal. It's a great start of the day, or like that. And so, so then you, you with this app, you may get the partners to control your daily living nutrition uh, together in, in the, like, by the AI. So, and next, please. What is a good uh, opportunity for this kind of the development app is we can uh, gather the data with which we can analyze who is, uh, the, who is vulnerable in the current situation, like this uh, evidence. Using the data of this app, we analyze the, analyze the impact of work, the change in the work conditions during the period of governmental stay at home recommendations for COVID-19 response. And some of the people have increased the risks of the dep depression due to the, you know, the physical distancing policy. Okay, next please. And uh, these digital tools can be applied for even for the older people. Uh, just designing that for age friendly, that can be useful for the older people as well. Okay, bottom line, to create the equitable society, uh, I think the, the making the, the, the policy making styles from the government to governance and the making partnerships beyond the health sector is very important. And using the up-to-date behavior sciences uh, not knowledge base is also useful and uh, using technology and data to connect people and organizations without direct contacts and more efficient ways than before the COVID-19 situation is also uh, important. And finally, the incentivizing individuals toward healthy choices and organizations, also the incentivizing the organizations for creating effective services is necessary in the current day uh, 
Eva. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Kondo. And then it was very intriguing to learn the merge of a technology and then a behavior or insight, as well as your concept of a government to governance was very uh, interesting to learn. So uh, thank you very much. So now we'd like to uh, take a closer look at the, how the local government can foster social innovation. And Ms. Jun, uh, please tell us the, how the Seoul Metropolitan Government is encouraging social innovation amongst the 50 plus age group. Uh, over to you. Ms. Jun, are you there? I'm Hei Yoon Aileen Jung from Seoul 50 Plus Foundation. And first of all, thank you very much for um, giving this opportunity to share um, Seoul's case on how Seoul is tapping into um, the talent and experience. Uh, I'd like to start with how Seoul 50 Plus Foundations came into being. Soul 50 Plus Foundations is the affiliate organizations of the Seoul Metropolitan. We are 100% funded by the Seoul Metropolitan Government, and we are the implementing channel of the Seoul 50 Plus policy. Um, as you can see from the graph, um, Korea is um, a Korea is going through a drastic increase of the senior populations. 14% of the populations are aged five. And Korea, as um, Dr. Okatayu first um, um, pointed it out, um, we are entering into, entering into the age society um, faster than any other country in the, among the um, developed countries, including US, Japan, Germany, or France. Um, it only took 17 years to um, transform from aging to age society. Korea is indeed a grain country. 22% um, of the national populations are the baby boomers population. However, does baby boomer baby boomer population are an elder or younger older groups? However, unfortunately, these people are looking into retirement. Uh, Miss Jun, I think uh while sort of you are restoring your connection, I suggest that we move on to the next speaker and then we come back to you, if that's okay with you. Okay, so uh, meanwhile, so let's move on to the last panelist, the Miss Masako Akiyama. She's the founder of Maggie's Tokyo and Cares. And we are very excited about uh, her work in the community, in the enga community engagement in the aging society from Japan, which is a super aged society. In, in the region. And she has kindly prepared a video to tell her story to get started. So could we have a video, please? ここは2011年の7月にオープンしました地域に開かれた与老津相談所暮らしの保健室と言います。予約なしにどんな相談でも受けられるところ、健康相談やら医療や介護のこととか、それからまあそれに直接関わらなくても。暮らし向きでとても困ったこととかどこに行ったらいいのかわかんないとかそういうご相談も受けます。1990年に私の2つ上の姉を、えー、末期の肝臓がんで、まあ、余命1ヶ月ということでそういう宣告を受けたんですけれども家に連れて帰って、まあ、療養したんですね1989年から90年今から30年前っていうのはが、えーまあ、癌の方をがんの人を、まあ、家で、えー、見るっていうのは、まあ、無謀というのかほぼないというのか、えー、とただ14歳と11歳の、まあ男の子2人いまして母親としてのまあ役割を果たせるのは家だろうと、えー、そういうことで家に連れて帰ってきて子どもたちと一緒にいる時間を増やしたというか
そういうことをすることであの1ヶ月って言われたのが4ヶ月半ま伸びたのはやっぱり誰とどこでどんなふうに過ごすかっていうのとっても大事なことだと、まあ、そこで気がつかされたっていうことですよね。家族と一緒に家で過ごしたいっていう人のために看護をまあ届ける仕事つまり病院,を病院から出て、えー、まあ人々のところに出向くというそういう在宅医療やまあ訪問看護そういうことが必要なんじゃないかなと思いました。今目の前にね現れているその人々が、あのー、やっぱりとてもユニークな人生をそれぞれ歩んでこられているので,でその方たちにのその人生にまあ敬意を払いよく話を伺うっていうか聞くっていう姿勢をこう貫いていくとその方の経験が私の経験にもなりでそのことをまた人に語ることでまたその経験が生きていく子育て中でとっても孤立しているお母さん世代とかそれから居場所が定まらない子どもたちそういう人たちにもぜひ利用して行ってほしいしそういう人がまたあのいい形でボランタリーというかにここにいろんなことをしてくれるようになってくれたらいいなと思っています。Okay, thank you very much, Misa Kiyama, sharing your experience. And then I understood that you also have some presentation to share with us. So it is over to you. はい。あ、新旧通り、マッチフォーギビングメディスオプチュニティトゥデイ。私は早めに相談の窓口につながり、え、重症化、重度化しないで、なるべくゆるやかな経過をたどって、最後に自然な最後を迎えられる、そういう
ここはこの大きな団地は高齢化率現在ですでに 56% を超えています。一人暮らしの方も4割を超えるというそういう非常に、えー、高齢者の多い、えー、集,集合住宅です。Uh, and then left picture shows the housing complex where the、uh, our, our health center is located. The proportion of the older people who are age 65 years older is already 56%. And then the one in four、uh, household is not、uh, older people living alone. その中の商店街の一角、元は本屋さんだったところをこのようにリノベーションして、とても居心地のいい場所に変えました。このモデルはイギリスのがんの相談支援施設、マギーズキャンサーケアリングセンターを、えー、お手本にしています。Uh, light four pictures are inside of the our center. So, the,、uh, I think some of you know the、uh, Magid Center in the UK, which provides the support for the cancer patient. I really, look,、uh, I really like the、uh, Magid Center, so that I like to create a similar environment like the Magid Center. Thank you.、Uh, next slide, please. Could you click the、uh, number one? Number one. そこではさまざまな活動が行われていて6つの機能が発揮されています。一、えー、つは、えー、この,サジあの相談機能ですね、コンサルテーションオフィスとしての機能です。そして、えー、市民との2番目ですね、市民との、えー、学びの場、市民教育の場になっています。そして、えー、安心な居場所、3番目です。えー、ここへ来てもあの、まあ、危なくないって言ったらおかしいですけども、えー、会話が十分で生きるという、そういう保障された場です。まずはその3つ。Okay. Uh, this place has no six function. And then I'd like to explain the、uh, three functions at the first. The first one is in the consultation office. So the,、uh, and then the people can easily to come here and then they make the consultation to the nurse and then other volunteer staff. And then function number two is the place to run with the citizens. So the,、uh, I try to this place to、so、open to the public and the citizens. So the、uh, general public is also can easy to come to this place and learn each other. And lastly, function number three is the safe place to stay. So that whenever people come into this place, people can feel like they are safe and then secure. そして世代を超えてつな、えー、がる交流の場で、えー、若い世代も、えー、できるだけ来れるようにしていくっていう4番目の機能そして医療や介護福祉の連携の場であるという、えー、5番目の機能そして、えー、地域の中でボランティアを育てるという場である育成の場であるという6番目の機能が発揮されています。Uh, another function and、uh, function number four is the place for the、uh, interaction with the younger generation. So, the, even the main user of this place is older people, but I would like to try to connect the older generation and younger generation through this platform. And then, function number five is the place for collaboration. So, the older people need the medical care, of course, but they also need long term care and then also the social care. So, the, I would like to,、uh, this place to be a place for the collaboration. And then, last function about function number six is a place to foster volunteers in the community. So, the older people they sometimes receive the support from volunteers, but in the end, older people themselves can be a volunteer in the end.、はい uh, next slide, please. The Koko Dio Sta Katano Keka O Chilan Hyoni Ste, Shimiste Arimas. この図の特徴は、左側にの一番上が、えーまあ、事例というか,か、患者さんとか、利用者です。そして真ん中が家族で、そして下が、えー、介護かあ、医療等の関わりを示しています。Okay. Uh, this is the example of the life course, how this center supported for the older person. And this is the example of the 89 years old man who were diagnosed with esophageal cancer. The upper light yellow、uh, is the,、uh, how this patient,、uh, the course, treatment course for the,、uh, the 89 years old person. And then the middle of the pink, it shows the how family members supported the patient. 
And then in the bottom, orange and then blue are how did this center and then also the medical sector and the long-term care sector support it to the patient and family. え、uh, as, as he started to use in this place, even before he is diagnosed by the cancer, and then he already have a connection between the nurse and the other staffs of this center, so that the, uh, he often come this place and then make a consultation about his minor health trouble and health condition, so that the uh, staff this center uh, went him to the hospital and then the, he was diagnosed with cancer at a very early stage. え、病状自体は非常に重たいものでしたけれども、え、家に帰りたい。家で過ごしたいという願いを叶えるために、え、病院と地域がよく話し合って、そして家に帰ってきて最後は、え、彼の望み通り家で亡くなっています。あ、as uh, so the uh the this center supported the patient and the family to how to support his at his home. And then finally he died at 89 years old at home. え、家族は、え、亡くなった後にこう言いました。え、彼の奥さんが、え、本人の死体ようにできてありえないくらいいい最後だった。つまり満足した、え、最後だったというふうに述べています。I uh, even the family members after he dies, uh, the family members say that it was a very good uh, environment for the end of life care and then they not only the patient but also the family members are very satisfied with his the uh, uh, end of life situation. そして次お願いします。Uh, next slide please. この経過をもとに え、住民向けに、市民向けにこのような uh, after he dies, I organized the seminar uh, where the, uh, we could share the experience about this patient. So not only the all the stakeholders, uh, but the, uh, all the other staff from this center so, uh, participated in the seminar as an analyst. こういう地域住民向けの、え、実際の事例を使った研修会というのは、え、当事者意識が芽生え、非常に身近に感じるということもあり、なおかつここに参加をした家族は自分の話をすることでフリーフケアにもつながります。あ、it uh, was a very good opportunity for the general public to know about the how how is the uh, reality to support the patient at home and then also it was a good opportunity to the family members because by speaking the experience it are uh, kind of the grief care for the family members. そして この方もなんですが、最後のところは重装備というか医療処置がたくさんなくても非常にナチュラルな経過をたどります。え、そのことともとても大事な要素として、え、皆さんに伝えます。uh, so the, in, the, in his case, uh, even he is diagnosed by the cancer, but at home he does not he did not receive any uh, high high advanced medical care at home. Uh, next それから徐々に頻度を高く接していく中で、さまざまな病院とのやり取りもありましたけれども、あまり長く入院せずと家に帰ってきて療養を続けていました。uh, 
uh, when he was in 94, she was in 94 years old, 10 years before the she dies. So that we already have a good connection with the, her and her family members. So the, uh, she often come to the, this center and then make a consultation about her minor problem. So we will know about the, what kind of needs her, what kind of needs she had. え、途中から、え、この出血を起こした後は、かなり重篤な症状でしたけれども、看護小規模多機能型居宅介護というミモザの家というサービスをまた組み合わせて、それから3年間行き、最後はお家で亡くなっています。she had the uh, cerebral, cerebral hemorrhage and then the, after that she had a severely dis disabled but the, uh, we are providing any uh, variety of uh, long-term care service to her uh, she could stay home for three years next え、今年はもう日本全国8万人いるという状態の中で、こういう長い経過を持ちながら最後を迎えられる方っていうのは、あの、たくさんいらっしゃるわけで、その時に、え、医療処置をたくさん使うという重装備ではなくて、なるべく
Okay, uh, this is my last presentation slide. So the uh, in Japan, most of people are very easy to go to the healthcare facilities even at the very end of life. So the uh, I like to change the people's awareness of the not calling an ambulance car immediately, especially for the at the very end of life stage. But in order to change the people's awareness and then also support the uh, patients their families to stay at home even at the uh, very end of life, uh, I like to make the final phase of someone's life warm and then natural. And then this place are uh, like to be a place to provide the support for the patient family members. Uh, thank you very much. This is the end of my presentation. Thank you very much for your kind attention. Thank you very much, Mr. Kiyama, for the video and then for your explanation. So it is quite impressive to see that you demonstrated that the lifelong supporting environment and then linking different services make a significant difference in individuals and then the community. So thank you very much for that. And if possible, uh, I wonder if uh, uh, Eileen Jun, uh, Ms. Jun, are you back to online now or not yet? I'm back. Okay. Can you uh, kindly resume the presentation? And now we will control the slide from this side. Sure, because... sure. Sorry for all the disconnection. Okay. Rajimi, can you go back to where she was? So, so should I start from this page? Okay. And so Seoul's national populations um, twenty two percent of um, national populations are the fifty plus generation, and they are basically um, different from the traditional senior age group. They don't want to be called themselves old, rather they would like to be called older younger old or modern elder. However, unfortunately, these people are um, facing retirement at the age of fifty next. Average retirement age in Korea from their lifetime main job is 49 years old. It is very young. In the meantime, um, due to their individual um, economic circumstances, they still have to retain their economic activities until 71, which means there is a 20 years of gap between um, retirement from their main job and retirement from their economic activities. What do they have to do at the age of 50 when they have to prepare for more than they when they have to do economic activities for more than 20 to 30 years in the age of 100 year life? This was the question. We did a um, research um, against um, among the 50 plus generations, what were their main concerns were in the policy, the initial stage of policy development. There were three major concerns. Um, 50 plus generations thought they feel very insecure and they still want to work and they had nowhere to go next. However, 50 plus generations of Seoul and also Korea, they have a huge potential. Um, 50 plus generations were the driving forces to economic development of Korea. Next. As I said, 50 plus generations are distinct from the traditional senior age group. They are highly educated. They are mid and high income group and they know how to voice themselves as a casting vote and they are going through a critical life transition period in a changing life cycle at the age of 100 year life. Next. So we needed a paradigm shift in developing a 50 plus policy. There were um, welfare policies, um, lifelong, lifelong learning policies, and also um, um, job support policies. However, none of the policies solely targeted for the 50 plus, 50 plus um, generations itself. So we wanted to make sure we want to support the 50 plus generations, be prepared for the future. But how was always how was the question? Next. So our policy focused on what 50 plus have to do to want to do. Next. 
from by by translating personal experiences to social capital next from end of career to encore career next and not a one-time welfare but a sus sustainable welfare that could ensure 50 plus can be prepared in advance to prepare for their life after 50. Next. And we wanted to make sure this is not only government led, but driven by the 50 plus generations themselves, because this is a policy for them. Next. So Seoul started by introducing the 50 plus campus on ground to make sure that 50 plus generations have a place to go in 27, 2016. Currently we have um, three campuses in operations. Next. Next. At the campus, our policy service is designed to resolve the three major concerns of the 50 plus generation. We provide lifelong learning and development programs and work and social engagement opportunities and also provide um, a place where they can create their cultural and infrastructure by themselves. Next. 50 plus campus is a interactive platform where we provide one stop service from counseling to education programs to um, pr providing work and social engagement opportunities. Um, 50 plus generation can start up, a start a community group or social venture or startup. Um, and our service is designed to provide step-by-step, step-by-step um, step um, support services from mentoring um, and providing seed monies as well. Uh, we wanted to ensure these people uh, can pursue their encore career by meeting new 50 plus peers through um, through step by step um, services. Next. Our service is uh, we um, so is Seoul's ambition is to um, provide the 50 plus infrastructure in each district of Seoul. Of Seoul. Currently, we have three 50 plus campus in operations and, and we are expected to um, build by 60 campus by 2022. Next. And a regional autonomous level um, 50 plus center um, which is currently seven centers in operations, and we are expected to develop, uh, establish 19 by 2022. So in total, all citizens will have access to um, 50 plus infrastructure by 2022. Um, with the start of the Seoul Metropolitan Government, um, it was national government also um, announced to start a systematic support for the 50 plus generation nationwide in 2017, while Seoul started um, the policy from 2013. Next. Ever since the national government's in announcement of initiative, um, um, Seoul has become the benchmark case for central and local governments in Korea. And also we have been recognized by the OECD as a public innovation success case in 2018 in terms of inclusiveness. Um, there are still a lot of challenges to go, a, a, a lot of challenges ahead, but we are um, excited that um, our 50 plus policy is becoming nationwide, nationwide. Um, next. Um, and also, um, just to give you an idea of how we tailor our programs for 50 plus generations at the campus, I want to end my presentations with showing a short um, video clip of what 50 plus has been doing digitally um, because they were not able to come to the campus during the COVID-19 pandemic during the past few months. Next. Oh, sorry. Um, uh, sorry, I think I won't be able to share our activities or video. Um, thank you very much. And um, I would look forward to um, discussing further with you in the next next detail. Thank you very much.
Thank you very much, Ms. Jun. Indeed, we visited the 50 Plus Foundation earlier this year. And then I was quite impressed with the wide range of programs and services available for 50 plus generations and help them find their uncle career. And then including the life as a professional, life as a family member and life as a community member. And then uh, this uh, program is actually really helpful for them to find a new life in a 100 year life uh, uh, society. So thank you so much. And then thank you very much for all the panelists. And now we'll quickly hear from our audience member. First, uh, Professor Sierra Bonilo uh, from uh, University of Philippines uh, would like to share uh, what your thoughts on the digital and then social innovation we have heard today. And we are very interested in uh, your perspective from Philippines and what can be possibly adapted in this uh, uh, country. Over to you, Professor Bonilo. Thank you very much. Um... So what digital and social innovations are likely to be adopted and prosper for promoting healthy aging in a developing country like the Philippines? So from the potentials offered by Society 5.0, an image of automated society where robots are doing physical tasks and caring for patients, maybe this is a scenario that is not likely to happen in the Philippines in the next decade or so. But then, of course, there are more digital and social innovations that are happening now as we have heard from the panel of speakers this afternoon. From mHealth examples using clinical decision support systems in providing care, medication adherence apps, to social innovation apps to change people's behavior, and uh, supportive care in communities. So there is a wide range of digital and social innovations that can be adopted. It is not about how high tech the innovation is to have a strong impact to society. Even low-tech solutions can have wider impact when it is applied where it is needed most. So now in the Philippines, uh, with the COVID-19 pandemic, where our senior citizens are forced to stay inside their homes for six months now and counting, we are rethinking, researching, and redesigning how telehealth can provide the needed health services. So telemedicine through SMS-based applications and web-based platforms is gaining traction. Hospitals are also uh, innovating how their outpatient services are provided by having uh, process innovations like e-appointments and e-consultations. Hopefully, more efficient systems will change the health-seeking behaviors of our senior citizens. And we hope to be able to provide telenursing as well in the future from doing assessments of activities of daily living, providing simple nursing interventions and health education, and supporting coordinated and integrated services. Another possibility is using artificial intelligence in managing and analyzing big data uh, to promote a life course perspective in healthy aging. Uh, Filipinos are early adopters of many information technology products and services, especially when it comes to the use of social media. So senior citizens are by no means left out, especially when it is about connecting with their friends and relatives, as well as getting some entertainment using their phones and tablets. Learning from data-driven businesses, how behaviors can be influenced to address some commercial determinants of health. Uh, I think there's an opportunity for nudging to ensure that positive health behaviors are reinforced. Uh, there is a challenge, of course. Uh, that in all these innovations, access and equity issues to technology should be addressed. I believe that innovation should be in the hands of the people and not only through a limited few who can afford and know how to use it. This become a consideration when pushing for technological innovation in health, especially when there is a public-private divide, a decentralized health system like in the Philippines. So thank you for this chance uh, to share this uh, forum. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Bonito. It is always good to think uh, what is uh, feasible and then in the context of the country. And now we'd like to move on to our Q&A session. And then we got a few questions on the Q&A box. And then I found that a few questions on uh, uh, digital divide and encouraging sort of our target population to use the digital application. So maybe first, uh, let me ask uh, Professor Kondo, uh, how can we encourage more older people to use 
some of the tools that you introduced. Any sort of a good experience and advice? Yeah, uh, of course, it's, it's, as I said, it's, uh, the marketing it is very important. And for example, to make it fun or identify the, what they want and uh, the arrange the services as, so that the people are attracted by the services. This is a principle. Also, yeah, it, it's sim sim yeah, like that. And because uh, so usually in many uh, cases, people are not always think about their uh, health, but uh, want to maintain health. And health is the, not the purpose of life. So the, we need to identify what is the purpose of life of the, the, the target uh, populations. And that is important. Okay. Thank you very much. And similar questions to you, uh, Ms. Rak. Uh, your target audience is uh, people in a low resource settings. And how do you encourage the health workers and families, caregivers to adapt your technology when uh, there is uh, not enough resource available in the community? Thanks for that question. I, I do think that uh, digital technologies, uh, as I said, need to be designed for the infrastructure and the context in which they are going to be used. Um, for the for something like uh, the, the calm care system, one of the examples that we often cite is that you know when you give a laptop to an office worker, you don't expect that the office worker already has a laptop at home that they're going to use, um, but that is an investment that is made uh, because it enables and amplifies the work of that office worker in, in multiple ways. And so similarly, I think there are contexts in which it makes sense uh, for governments to invest in, in providing some of these digital technologies and associated training uh, to, to health workers uh, so that they can provide better services when we talk about uh, reaching out uh, directly to beneficiaries and to patients, that's not going to be feasible. And where we've made an incredible push in the past uh, couple of years uh, is increasing uh, the use of our technologies for things like customized SMS, uh, integrated WhatsApp, uh, also artificial intelligence, uh, interactive chatbots. Uh, that in the context of aging, there's I think the research is pretty mixed at this point, so it's still for us kind of a an R and D thing. But the ability for uh, interactive uh, chatbots using artificial intelligence to, for example, um, provide more social support uh, to uh, isolated elderly populations uh, as well. Um, but these days, I guess the good news is um, that that most people have, if not necessarily a phone, have access. Uh, to a phone or access uh, in a household to somebody who has a phone. Uh, and so there are ways to reach people through digital technology. It's a matter of uh, designing the technology in a way that is appropriate and contextual uh, to provide the value uh, that it possibly can. Okay, thank you so much. And the other question is to you, uh, Ms. Akiyama. So there were questions about the how to encourage more community members and nurses to come to you and then uh, attract as a volunteer. That's one question. And similar question is like, what was your experience and then success factors for the community engagement uh, as your uh, organization started the uh, services and it expanded and gaining more trust from the community? What was the success factor in your uh, experience? え、are the our core members and the volunteer are the uh, family family members so this center provides the grief care for the family members so this through the grief care the uh, family members realize that the uh, after the taking care of the patient uh, they need another role in the community and then the after that these family member in the center and then their friends or uh, knowing someone uh, can be uh, another volunteer member uh, 今この暮らしの保健室で 
毎月1回専門職が集まったその検討勉強会というかそうカンファレンスを行っていてそれは、えーえー、新宿区からの、えー事業助成というかお金予算がついていてますでそこで、えー、介護、看護、えー、福祉、さまざまな職種の人が集まって、地域の中でどういうケアが行われているかをあの毎月あのディスカッションしているんです。そこにさまざまな行政の方も含めて、えー、参加をされます。Uh, also one s u m m e r s、uh, this center hosts the,、uh, the center hosts the seminar. Uh, as always, there are relevant stakeholders, including nurses and caregivers, and then even the local government members. And then we share what kind of care needs this community has. And then through the discussion at the seminar, some of them become the volunteer members. つながりが続くようにえっ、ー、とい,いろんな人が出入りしても大丈夫だというそういう枠を小さくしないというのが良かったことかなと思っています。Uh, the, my answer to your second question,、uh, what is the success factor for the、uh, encourage more people to be get involved in our activity is that the,、uh, we do not Uh, set any、uh, strict regulation or rules to the volunteers and then other community members. And we try to be open to the, all the members in the community so that people are very easy to come to this place and then very easy to collaborate each other. Thank you. Thank you very much. Okay, so、uh, the last question is to you, uh, uh, Ms. Jun. So,、uh, the question is like, do you have any sort of a milestones for successful aging? And then, what are the sort of what do you define as a successful aging after 50 plus? Maybe it's a bit abstract question, but if you have any goals and then the milestones that you have,、uh, we'd like to hear from you.、Um, I think.、Um, This is quite a、um, thank you for the question.、Um, this is quite a、um, challenging question for me.、Um, milestone for us is how we develop a new social activities and job models through the process of、um, engaging 50 plus generations um, into, um, into, um, through, through,、um, through, through education programs. Meaning,、um, there are a lot of、um, social niche where、um, human resources are actually needed but、um, are not tapped into yet.、Um, we want to、um, explore the areas that、um, 50 plus generations can、um, reach there, meaning uh, uh, re reach there. So, we develop、um, New kinds of job models by partnering with a lot of、um, NGOs or other companies and make sure that these people can be involved、um, in the niche sector. In, in, in other words,、um, we do a、um, internship program at the internship program for the 50 plus generations at the social economy organizations, NGOs, or, or NGOs, or,、um, or, 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 gover or local, local communities. So, so we make sure that、um, we want to make sure that areas of, areas of job models are、um, explored and、um, piloted and scaled up. So, so we'd like to say that、um, making a new job model types, social engagement models, would be one of the、uh, milestones for our、um, work. And this will be, of course, followed by、um, systematic、um, training courses with the related stakeholders. Okay, thank you very much for sharing your experience and thoughts. Okay, it's about the time. So uh, let's uh, go to the drawing quickly and then uh, uh, conclude this、uh, session. So, as before, we got a very nice drawing from the、uh, colleague from Pushkin. So, on the left hand side, we talked about a healthy aging framework. So, society invests in older people, 
and other people contribute back to the society. So it's a good virtuous circle there. And then for the healthy aging, the health system needs to change and then different services, prevention and then curative and then uh, supportive care needs to be uh, integrated into a single service. And we talked about the different innovations, technological innovation, nudging and social innovation. And then uh, government should encourage tech, uh, different innovations in a different ways. And then uh, uh, Ms. Black from Dimanji talked about the be intentional, don't collect data nobody's using. And Professor Kondo talks about the nudging and the people's the organization towards healthy society. And then he introduced the integration between the behavioral science and then technology. And then Ms. Akiyama showed a very nice examples of uh, uh, general consultation office in the community and to support people over time in their lifelong and then uh, uh, provided the integrated services depending on individual needs. That was a very powerful uh, tool for the individual and then community. And then last one is the uh, 50 plus foundation providing the family and the professional support, lifelong learning, uncle career and sustainable welfare and then uh, involving in the policy uh, creation. So it was, uh, these uh, examples are fairly uh, good. Okay, so this was the summary. And then uh, uh, Gordon, I think uh, you have a final word for us. I, I think you have summarized <clears throat> very well, uh, Hiro, and uh, I like the illustration as it is. Um, maybe I will just make one point on uh, that unites all these presentations. Um, we have seen so many examples of what we are calling rethinking, redesigning. And as I was taking my notes, um, uh, the aging society became the silver society. Uh, technical solutions became no code solutions. Uh, primary healthcare centers and hospices and community centers came, became um, combined into one group of centers around their functions of providing safety, interaction, collaboration, voluntarism, learning, and consultation. And we saw the shifts in interpretation also in, in Seoul 50 plus um, from having to do on what on wanting to do from the personal to the social capital, from uh, a career to encore career from one-time welfare to sustainable welfare from government led to people led 50 plus led um, and we saw how nudging contributes to inequity rather than favoring the uh, those who are already well off in society and with the reaction from the philippines um, we saw that th these technology solutions and innovations are not necessarily uh, the province of richer countries because middle income economies already have uh, or thriving data driven businesses. And uh, in the discussant uh, reaction, we could see that uh, even middle income countries can leapfrog on existing social media and other uh, channels. M much of this is captured in spirit in the illustration and um, I, I just want to thank uh, Hiro and everyone for your participation. Back to you, Hiro. Thank you very much, uh, uh, Dr. Gordon. And then thank you very much for a summary. And then with this, this concludes the uh, session for uh, healthy aging and then innovation. And then thank you very much, particularly the panelists for your participation and then insight. And we highly appreciate it. And we wish you a good afternoon. Thank you.